The, our first talk after lunch is Carol Grissom. Carol has been a senior objects conservator at the Smithsonian Institute since 1984, specializing in treatment of metal, stone, and plaster sculpture. An authority on zinc sculpture, she published Zinc Sculpture in America, 1850 to 1950, in 2009. She received her master's degree in art conservation at Oberlin College, took advanced training at the National Conservation Institutes in Belgium and Italy, and worked as a sculpture conservator at the Center for Archae Archaeometry at Washington University in St. Louis, and exhibits conservation at the National Gallery of Art. So that's what we're going to do. Welcome, Carol. Um, the goal of my talk is to remind you about um, cast iron. Oh, did I do the wrong thing here? Uh, cast, iron, uh, cast iron fountains, which we haven't, surprising to me, seen much of today. Uh, also, if uh, you see a cast iron fountain with a statue, I would say nine times out of ten, it, it has or had uh, the, the statue made out of zinc. Sometimes they've uh, been replaced with other things, but typically they're made out of zinc. Uh, I wanted to begin with a little historical background. As um, many of you know, uh, fountains in this country were few and far between in the 18th century, and even in the early 19th century, they tended to be a single jet d'eau, as you see in Charles Wilson Peale's uh, fountain that's indicated by the arrow. Um, the first public water, uh, public fountain is considered to be um, the allegory of the school kill or the water nymph and bittern, uh, which was. Uh, at the pumping station in Philadelphia, a celebration of the um, new public waterworks uh, in Philadelphia, 1809. It was then uh, it was made out of um, uh, wood by William Rush. Um, let's see, is this, is this the pointer? No, that's not the pointer. Uh, is this the pointer? I'm sorry. The, it's the it's button in the middle. Button in the middle. Okay. Uh, you see the, the fountain in the middle, which is was actually wood painted white, and presumably to imitate marble, yeah. and, and the base was painted brown. Uh, it was later uh, replicated in bronze, because obviously the wood wouldn't hold up very well in the fountain. Um, the Crystal Palace exhibition in London in 1851 was uh, a very important venue for the uh, circulation of art. And, uh, and fountains. On the left, you see a French uh, fountain by André, uh, which was entirely made out of cast iron, statues and uh, basins alike. Uh, and I also illustrate this with a, a, a stone fountain uh, that John Singer Sargent uh, made a watercolor of at a Medici villa. This was a standard um, uh, Renaissance type uh, with sometimes called a tazza uh, fountain uh, with statues and basins that uh, over which water flowed. Uh, at the Crystal Palace, another important thing that happened was that zinc statues were introduced uh, mainly by uh, the company of Moritz Geis in Berlin. I've circled the Amazon on horseback and a boy and swan in their exhibit. Um, these statues were uh, later uh, used and, and copied in the U.S. Uh, for American fountains. Uh, in fact, uh, the German Prince Albert uh, somehow obtained the boy and swan for his private home on the Isle of Wight in the U.K., where it still uh, is uh, displayed. Uh, the Zig statues very quickly uh, took over from the cast iron statues for fountain, fountains, particularly in this country and in Germany, uh, because they were so much easier and cheaper to cast. Uh, you could, uh, zinc uh, cast, uh, melts at a relatively low temperature and can be soldered together with lead tin solder so that uh, you avoid the very tedious uh, uh, mold making that you would have with uh, statues made in cast iron. And if you, made, if you made a statue in cast iron, either you have to use you know, 50 piece molds or you would have to somehow very tediously put it together mechanically. 
the zinc statues were always painted, or almost always painted, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, and so you could make them out of a lot of pieces and then just, just paint the thing. Uh, once this was figured out, they, they really took over. Um, I show you this though, in the first uh, fountains in the US, uh, as they were in France, were made entirely out of cast iron. In this case, the, the statue at the top and, the, and other things were made out of uh, cast iron by uh, Robert Wood out of Philadelphia, or it, sometimes it was called Wooden Perot. You see the, their factory there. Uh, it's thought that they erected this Hebe fountain uh, near the factory in Philadelphia. Um, they, went, they went bankrupt about 15 years later though, and uh, very quickly, uh, fountains were copied mainly from Europe uh, with uh, zinc statues. Uh, this Forsyth Park fountain in Savannah is considered the first uh, such fountain in the U.S., and it's almost an exact copy of the all-cast iron Andre fountain. Uh, the, the, the James Beebe and Company fountain, uh, James Beebe and Company, many of you may, may know, made the cast iron uh, for the, the uh, U.S. Capitol dome, and they also made uh, some, some fountains. Uh, in fact, they sent a man to the Crystal Palace exhibition uh, to check things out, and apparently he ended up copying the, uh, the fountain. Here's another example of it. These statues, however, I must say, are, have since been replaced with uh, bronze copies. Um, most of the uh, Saint statues in the U.S., I believe, were made at this rather humble foundry in Williamsburg, New York. Uh, Moritz J. Seig was a German immigrant who came over around 1850 after the revolution and established a, a zinc fountain uh, because none other exi existed as yet. He was actually a, a sculptor who had worked in many materials but apparently found this as his niche. Um, uh, I just have a few dates here. Uh, 1858 is the first uh, uh, cast iron fountain zinc statues uh, produced produced in Savannah, and also James Beebe and company came out with a catalog. Uh, many of these uh, fountains were sold through catalogs, uh, principally by the iron manufacturers, although uh, uh, Salig would be uh, the producer of the zinc statues. He was sort of a subcontractor. Uh, the Civil War was obviously going to be a disruption to production of fountains um, as uh, factories turned to producing armaments. But after the war, there was a, a proliferation, again, of the cast iron fountains, uh, with the first uh, J.L. Mott Ironworks catalog that I found dated 1871. Uh, 1876, uh, the 1876 exhibition in Philadelphia uh, was, a, was an, an important venue in the States uh, for cast iron fountains. And here you see uh, one in front of Horticultural Hall with lots of statues uh, on and around the fountain. Uh, the, the heyday of these fountains was the fourth quarter of the 19th century, but in fact, one of the manufacturers, J.W. Fisk, continued uh, producing uh, catalogs until 1953. Um, I uh, counted up uh, these fountains uh, from, from my book and from other ones that I found out about, and um, I wanted to show you uh, in this pie chart, more or less, the distribution. I found something like um, uh, 94 that are uh, extant or substantially in, in, intact around the country. Um, another 71 I consider dismembered, that is, they've either lost the statue or lost the cast iron. Uh, another 51 or a loss altogether, and uh, something like 41 replaced in another material, where the statue's been replaced in another material. Um, I actually suspect there might be more that have been replaced, but you, it's not always possible to know. Uh, I want to just show you briefly some of the subject matter. Uh, neoclassical statues were very popular. Here's, here's the Amazon again, which was uh, produced in America, I think uh, copied from an exact copy of the one that was produced in Berlin. Uh, you have lots of boys and water. 
uh, you see the, the little boy on top of a, a, a dolphin uh, structure, uh, dolphins around the base. Um, this is the James Beebe and Company showroom in New York uh, with the boy and fish fountain right there in the middle. And here you see the same statue on a Smithsonian fountain. Um, the boy uh, with the leaking boot, with the water emanating from the boot, uh, a sign is called the unfortunate boot, uh, was very popular, uh, as were, I don't have an illustration, but a little boy and girl in the rain, called Out in the Rain. Um, the ASPCA sponsored a lot of uh, fountains to prevent cruelty to animals, uh, topped with horses. Um, here is a, a Berenice Abbott a photo of a horse uh, at Columbus Circle. Um, uh, temperance figures of Hebe were very popular. Hebe uh, diluted uh, the god's wine with water, and uh, there were uh, two different versions that were purchased quite frequently. Uh, there was also uh, the famous uh, dentist who was a temperance advocate and uh, gave uh, temperance fountains to anyone who would take them. Uh, something like 11 of them had uh, his effigy with a temperance pledge in one hand and a glass of water in the other. Uh, curiously, not a single one of these survives. Uh, and I think in most cases it was a uh, drunken man in the dark of night who <laughs> threw it in the town lake or whatever. Uh, firemen were obviously suitable for these monuments. And I also wanted to point out that uh, Giuseppe Moretti, whom some of you probably know, um, actually modeled this sculpture, whereas uh, uh, most of these are copies of something else. Um, uh, and then we have soldiers and uh, Indians on top of fountains, not necessarily associated with water, but uh, suitable for monuments. Um, and uh, this is kind of a funny one of the vase bearer, uh, which was uh, sometimes modified uh, for local uh, purposes. Uh, this is a bull weevil on top of a, a vase bearer in Enterprise, Alabama. Actually, I think uh, all of this is replaced. Um, many of these statues were also in, on traffic islands and uh, have been broken by trucks. Um, I wanted to uh, show you a little bit about where these are found. They're not found in major cities, generally speaking. Uh, they were cheap, and they were generally uh, sold to small towns. Uh, I don't know of a single one in Kansas City, for example, uh, although I, I would have thought they, they might be, the time period might be suitable for one. Uh, you can see like there are quite a few up in the Adirondacks even. Uh, this is, uh, I think you can probably see, it, 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 and, and in godforsaken parts of Pennsylvania, <laughs> up here in the Northwest. <laughs> um, they were um, uh, also, they were sometimes at hotels. Uh, this is the Ho Hotel Coronado in near, uh, in, in San Diego. Um, Soldiers' Homes, uh, this is a uh, hotel in Montezuma, New Mexico, with a, a fountain indicated by the arrow. Um, this is, uh, was a housing development in, near, in Indianapolis. It's uh, populated by uh, several fountains and uh, statues as, as part of the sales pitch, no doubt. Um, I wanted to mention uh, that uh, these were not really competing with the uh, uh, bronze fountains, which were far more expensive. Uh, and not, and, and the, the first ones, uh, it's thought that the Tyler Davidson fountain, which was made uh, in Germany in 1871, is the first major bronze fountain in, the, in this country. The Bethesda fountain in Central Park it, uh, followed soon thereafter. Um, I, uh, in this country, the bounce families weren't really up to making these things probably until the 1890s, I would guess. Um, uh, deterioration uh, is uh, obviously a problem with these, as it is with most fountains. Uh, 
they're expensive to repair and often dysfunctional, uh, as, as is this uh, Neptune fountain at Sailor Snug Harbor that I photographed in 1981 with a scary looking dog in the background and very little water. Um, uh, sometimes uh, they've lost limbs. Uh, this is the same statue, and on the left, uh, you can see that it's lost its um, lower legs. And shortly after I took the photograph of the uh, statue on the right, it was stolen. Uh, breakage is, a, in, is probably the biggest problem uh, with zinc statues, or, and they also, over time, tend to disassemble at the solder, the solder seams. Um, Corrosion can be a serious problem. This is the Neptune statue a few years after the 1981 photo. And you can see it no longer has its uh, left arm attached. And the detail shows the corrosion on the wrist. Uh, not only do you have uh, pitting, but you can also see there's significant surface recession from the dark lead, lead tin solder and the, and the adjacent zinc. Um, I, I suspect that uh, chlorine has something to do with this. Uh, zinc does not hold up very well in, with, uh, in a, a chlorinated atmosphere, so it's, it's not the brightest material for a fountain figure, actually, particularly one that's not kept painted. Um, this is a, a metallographic cross-section uh, with the uh, exterior surface at the top, and you can see how uh, eaten into uh, the surface of the zinc is by, the corro by corrosion. Um, I didn't happen to have a, a photograph of a fountain figure that's uh, filled with concrete, but uh, it happens. And I instead am showing you uh, a monument that has been filled with concrete. This is a disaster. Don't ever do this. Um, you typically get uh, a slight gap between the zinc and the concrete, and then uh, with uh, what we think happens is that with uh, uh, freeze thaw, you get horrible jacking of the metal. Um, uh, this is Tom Pardoner, who's here, uh, soldering together uh, lead tin, uh, soldering together uh, not a fountain figure but a clock with lead tin solder. Uh, this is probably the most durable treatment but uh, for repairing a zinc statue, but it, it's not the easiest uh, to achieve. You need some skill. Um, one can also use uh, uh, epoxy putties or, or some kind of plastic material, uh, but it, in a fountain uh, figure, it probably wouldn't hold up uh, anywhere near as well, I would guess. Um, as I said, there were uh, at least 41 out of the 257 uh, fountains that I found were uh, had figures that are replaced. Uh, in, in this case, the, the Neptune fountain has been replaced with a bronze copy, I think fairly successfully, although there, there is something strange in, to me about uh, a, an in, such an inexpensive uh, figure being replaced with such an expensive copy, but um, that's not mine to judge, I guess. Um, uh, here's uh, a fountain that I believe has been, re where the statues have been replaced with aluminum copies. I know that Robinson Iron often uh, replaces statues with aluminum copies, and I'm pretty sure they did this one. Um, aluminum in a fountain is not a good idea, though. Uh, this is, are some cherubs that, uh, aluminum cherubs that were replacement figures about 20 years ago, and they're, the surfaces are very corroded, as you can see, and in some places, like in the right foot, for instance, of that, uh, uh, the, the front figure uh, is actually perforated from uh, corrosion. Uh, all, as I said, all of these figures were originally painted or treated in some way to imitate something else. Uh, zinc was considered very unattractive. It's kind of a dull gray. Um, and one of the most common treatments was imitation bronze. Uh, we know this from all kinds of documentation, including some of the catalogs. Um, this tradition started in Europe. 
Uh, here is a Neptune fountain with, with remains of bronze paint. No, it, I'm sure it's not original, but uh, uh, in any case, many of the European ones had imitation bronze, which at that time uh, would have been uh, a dark statuary brown uh, made with copper flake paint, copper or brass flake paint. Uh, I, this is kind of hard to read, but uh, this is a catalog uh, of J.W. Fisk showing the uh, Neptune fountain uh, that I sh just showed you. And you could purchase uh, the fountain for one sum, uh, painted one coat, which was apparently a primer, or bronzed for about 10% more. Um, in this case, uh, Fisk actually wrote to um, uh, the head of this of Sailor Sun Harbor and said, "I will send my the fountain with paint with one coat of paint, and uh, and then I will send my best man to bronze it and uh, finish it with a first uh, first class in a first class manner with a final coat of spar varnish." And uh, with some difficulty, I found uh, a sample that showed uh, essentially that layering. Uh, the the primer was a white lead followed by a, a brown paint and then a copper flake uh, uh, paint and then uh, spar varnish followed then by layers of, of uh, repaint uh, beginning with that yellow layer. Um, one can also look at things like postcards, uh, as you see on the left, or old photographs that suggest uh, a bronze coating. And, and you'll see here that the entire fountain, uh, both the cast iron elements and the, the zinc statue, were painted the same way. Uh, this shows uh, a soldier's fountain in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, that was uh, uh, treated about, I mean, it's a while now, uh, uh, 15 years ago maybe, with a uh, in this case, mica flake paint imitating the original bronze. Uh, in this case, that, although the, the base was originally uh, uh, a bronze paint too, they found some uh, uh, imitation uh, uh, stone paint and decided to do that on the lower portion. Um, uh, this fountain, uh, was painted entirely with a dark brown paint, um, which, uh, given the fact that it's about 50 feet from the uh, Atlantic Ocean on Martha's Vineyard, uh, seems like an excellent idea. And also because uh, it's not a fountain that uh, is well maintained. Uh, I saw it about 10 years after the treatment, and it, it looked to be in excellent condition still. Uh, uh, while in the 19th century, most of the uh, bronze uh, surface treatments were dark brown, in the 20th century, uh, verde antique or antique green came in. Uh, I don't know that uh, actually that this fountain was uh, painted in that way originally, but uh, it's been done in a sort of verde antique, which I think is fairly successful. Uh, I also wanted to point out, in this case, the. Um, the, the goat head spouts, you see around, down here around the, the basin. Uh, those are, are actually made out of zinc, whereas the basin itself is made out of cast iron. And if you uh, should work on one of these, you need to make sure which parts are cast iron and which parts are zinc. Of course, the cast iron is magnetic, whereas the zinc isn't. So it's fairly easy if you think about it. But uh, whereas you might want to sandblast or blast uh, the paint off the cast iron portions, you absolutely don't want to do that to the zinc. Um, and there would be other treatments that might be suitable for uh, uh, cast iron, but not zinc. Uh, this is just a couple more examples of, uh, of uh, uh, bronze treatments. Uh, and, uh, and related to the bronze, I wanted to uh, mention that some of the catalogs actually specify what sort of treatments they think are suitable. And they, one of the catalogs mentioned that the uh, Amazon should always be bronzed. Uh, I did encounter one monument which I think is, is completely wrong-headed in terms of the treatment. In this case, the Amazon uh, 
which it, this monument had been treat, had been uh, hit several times by a truck. Uh, and they put the original statue in the local historical society and had they uh, had a replica made in bronze, which they then painted gray to imitate to imitate zinc, <laughs> which is uh, not at all a historical kind of treatment for something like this. Uh, imitation stone, uh, typically uh, marble, uh, was another treatment that was popular. Here I show you on the left uh, a Berlin-made statue painted white, and uh, the same statue that was copied in, in this country by Mott uh, in Sandwich, New Hampshire. This statue was recently uh, rededicated, re put back together and rededicated, and also painted white, I'm glad to report. Uh, this, the fountain in Savannah, for the fountain in Savannah, there's actually some historical documentation that it was uh, meant to be uh, painted in imitation of Sienna stone. I'm not sure that they knew what that was, but uh, apparently that they thought it meant uh, painted white with uh, yellow ochre veins. Uh, here's a detail of... Um, that fountain in Indi one of those fountains in Indianapolis. Uh, white is obviously very common. It, it's sometimes not very popular now because it shows the rust, as you can see in this illustration. But the detail is very easy to read. And I wanted to show you a comparison with, uh, with the same figures on painted black or dark green. Uh, the catalogs actually don't have any mention of black or dark green but they seem to be one of the most common treatments now. Uh, here you see details, uh, comparisons of two of the figures uh, from uh, on the left from Indianapolis and on the right from Bowling Green. Uh, the figures on the right are also copies. You can see they're not very accurate copies. Um, and another pair. And, and, and you can see that the detail is so much easier to read in the ones that are, are painted white. Um, Polychromy also occurs, although, uh, and, and there's a history of that in Germany. Uh, you have this Venus, very brightly painted. Uh, it wasn't, well, okay. Uh, he, and there is some tradition of, of painting wooden statues outside uh, with polychromy. This is the famous uh, home of Timothy Dexter with uh, many uh, statues up on those columns. Uh, painted naturalistically. Uh, in the catalogs of the uh, fountain, for the fountains, typically though they restrict the polychromy to uh, animals, mostly dogs, in terms of what they say would be polychromed. Uh, nonetheless, this is America and you can paint your fountain however you want after you buy it with painted one coat. Uh, I actually enjoy some of these polychromos. I think this one's fairly successful. Some of the others are not so successful, uh, I think you could say. And this is the Amazon that is supposed to always be bronzed. Uh, I wanted to conclude uh, with my examples with some of the white bronze uh, monuments, uh, which were made by the Monumental Bronze Company and its affiliates out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, these were made of uh, zinc that was put together instead of with lead and solder with zinc itself. And the surfaces were sandblasted to imitate um, stone. These are primarily cemetery monuments. Um, and I should say if you coat them with a clear coating, it tends to kill the imitation stone appearance. Uh, there were several uh, fountains that were uh, made this way. Uh, I haven't, in fact, it, uh, examined any of these fountains uh, very closely, with one exception now that I think about it. Um, and most of them had been painted subsequently. I, and that could be because the water uh, is not a good combination with the, with the zinc. Uh, this one is painted gray, uh, as is this one in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, and this is my uh, final, these are my final photographs. Uh, uh, the fountain on the left is the original uh, Cogswell Fountain in Vernon, Connecticut. Um, 
it was recently replaced with a fiberglass copy, and kind of to my horror, the whole thing was uh, painted to imitate a dark bronze, even though it never would have looked like that. It would have, it would have had that kind of bluish gray surface of the, of the white bronze instead. Uh, since I know you're going to ask me this, uh, uh, I wanted to mention something about the, about the paint. Um, I'm not really an expert on this, uh, but I, if it were me on a fountain, I would get the best quality paint I could onto this, onto uh, a cast iron fountain uh, with a zinc statue. Uh, the zinc isn't going to be as vulnerable as the cast iron, but you would want to paint it the same way, I think, usually, in most cases. Um, I spoke to Tom Podner about this, who's worked on a lot more cast iron fountains than I have, and he suggested uh, that one should definitely try to get professional advice from something like the uh, Society for Protective Coatings. And he emphasizes uh, very careful assembly. He uh, tends to paint the cast iron on, both on the inside and the outside and assembles everything with uh, stainless steel uh, fittings. <coughs> Uh, and uh, he emphasizes uh, annual inspection and touch-up. Uh, he tells me that the, the current favorite is something called uh, PSX uh, 700, which is an epoxy siloxane paint, uh, but uh, you all may have other ideas. So that's it. Oh, wait. Uh, some of my... Uh, uh, some of this information is in my book if anybody is interested. <laughs> so, that's it. Should I hang around? I haven't actually restored one of the, uh, one of those myself. Uh, Tom worked on a big monument uh, where they. Uh, Hired somebody to well, you can. You want to say something, Tom? Uh, yeah, the local monument, local New York, the Scottish country, all the way up to the top where the uh, soldier was bolted on. And so uh, we had that cut apart into three pieces by a diamond uh, cable saw cutting company that cuts concrete. They sliced it into three major sections. Uh, it was transported to their yard. They bored holes into the concrete and then they put their diamond cable through those holes and ran the diamond cable around while the cable was running and cut out the bulk of the concrete and then took out the last few inches by hand and they were really careful able to take out the concrete without cracking or further distorting the uh, zinc. So then we got the zinc shelves back and had to uh, reform them all the way back to casting the pieces in place areas that had been completely destroyed. Carol showed that one corner that was all blossomed out, so that had to be completely cut out and replaced. On a soldered sculpture, you could you could uh, either heat the seams or cut through the, the seams. There are usually tons of seams, so you could take something apart. Uh, it would be tedious, but you could certainly do it. Yeah? Is, is the point of the concrete to prevent creep? I'm sorry? Is the point of the concrete to prevent creep? Uh, I would say, uh, well, one of the, th I forgot to mention this, since most of these are located in small towns, there's also usually a dearth of uh, professional advice, and so usually the local uh, um, fix-it guy says, we'll fix this thing up good forever, and we'll pour concrete into it. That's usually how it happens. Um, and, and sometimes uh, they actually have the, like the, as they're pouring it in, it starts to bulge out the concrete. Sometimes terrible things happen, really terrible things happen. Uh, so, but it's surprisingly common. And I have one last question. Um, is there any foundries currently replicating zinc? Are they, anyone still casting zinc? You can, you can get people to do it for you. Uh, they aren't usually very happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Tom does it sometimes. So. I was going to say zinc casting is pretty common in uh, uh, die casting. Yeah, there's still a lot of foundries around that do that. Uh, and so we had help us on the logo monument. Actually, yeah. we recast actually from that. Right. Thank you. That, the die casting, of course, has a little bit of
you have a sink if you ask that too. Yeah. Those alloys are still available. So. Yeah. All right. So